So I'm going to start out with just some introductions. I'm Jason Shu. I'm a shoulder and elbow specialist that has been working here at the University of Washington for the past seven years. Uh, I'm a native of Ohio and then spent more, t more than a decade kind of traveling around the country from Chicago to Philadelphia to St. Louis, uh, training to become a shoulder specialist and then ended up here in the Pacific Northwest and I uh, really love it here. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that I get to work with really great people, including uh, Kirsten. So Kirsten, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, so I'm Kirsten Thompson, um, and I came out to University of Washington uh, in 2016 to start working with Dr. Shu. Um, prior to that, I was back east, uh, also working in shoulder elbow surgery. Um, so I've been in practice in, in shoulder and elbow specifically um, since about early 2014. Um, I'm originally from California, so it's nice to come back to the West Coast and get to enjoy a lot of the outdoor activities that are out here. All right, great. So we received a lot of really great questions ahead of time, which we incorporated into our talk here, and we'll try to answer all of them. But as we go along during the hour, if you have any questions that you think of, feel free to use the uh, Q&A button at the bottom, and we'll try to get to answering as many of the questions as possible. Uh, if we don't get to your questions, question and if you have further questions you can always feel free to email us anytime so this email that's uh, displayed here it's uh, Dr. Jason Shu at uw.edu you can email us anytime that email address actually goes to both me and Kirsten and we'll do our best to uh, answer any questions that you have so um, this webinar is going to be focused on shoulder pain uh, and as we'll see the shoulder is a very complex joint and a lot can potentially go wrong with the shoulder joint um, so um, instead of talking generally about how to treat shoulder pain, it's important for everyone to understand what can go wrong and how the treatment can differ depending on the problems that we encounter. Uh, but before we get into the problems that cause pain and dysfunction in the shoulder, I just wanted to note how complex and intricate the shoulder joint is. You can see on this diagram that there's a lot of elements in the shoulder, including bones, tendons, muscles, uh, ligaments, and other structures that are finely balanced in order to provide every person with good mobility of their shoulder. And uh, if you think about it, the shoulder has the most range of motion of any joint in the body. And so for this to happen, the bones have to be in good shape and all the surrounding muscles and ligaments have to be balanced uh, well in order for the ball and socket to move normally. Um, because of the complex interplay of all the anatomic parts that you'll see here, uh, there's a lot of complex issues that can arise. And so uh, one of the reasons that Kirsten and I focus uh, pretty much exclusively on treating patients with shoulder uh, problems is because of how interesting we found the joint to be. And also by focusing on one joint, uh, we're able to provide patients with optimal care for uh, problems that are often very complex. So just to give you a quick background on the anatomy of the shoulder, uh, it's a basic ball and socket joint. So you can see here on this diagram here, here's the ball right here, and this is the socket. And it's uh, the anatomic terms are the humeral head and the glenoid, which is the socket. Uh, other structures that you'll see here is that this big bone right here is the, the shoulder blade or the scapula. And then this is the clavicle or the collarbone. So that, those compromise the, uh, the main bones of the shoulder joint. And then, um, as we mentioned before, bones are only a very small part of the shoulder, how, how the shoulder works well. And a, a few very important muscles that surround the shoulder are the set of four muscles called the rotator cuff muscles that you've probably heard of. So uh, we'll get into this a little bit more, but they surround the shoulder joint and allow for uh, movement and uh, raising your arm up and uh, rotating the arm around. So um, breaking each of these areas down, um, we, we kind of see, you know, we tried to focus on um, some of the most common problems that we see in each category. Um, so starting from, you know, the rotator cuff that Dr. Shu was just referencing, um, you know, pr pretty much when people injure that, we're talking about injuries to the tendons or the anchors from the muscle down to the bone. Um, down on the bony level itself, uh, there's the cartilage to think about, which is the smooth protective lining. Um, that gives people essentially a reduced friction when you're mobilizing or moving your shoulder. Um, so development of arthritis is when you start to you know, sort of lose that cartilage and there's increased friction and pain. Um, on the ligament level, that's you know, deeper in the joint itself, but aids in stability of the shoulder itself. Um, so if there's injuries on that front, often we're talking about issues with instability or the ball and socket not lining up correctly. Um, the lining that kind of encases the ball and socket underneath the muscular la layer is called the capsule. 
And there's a few different problems that can go wrong with the capsule, but one that we commonly see is uh, referred often as a, to as a frozen shoulder. Um, the formal name is adhesive capsulitis and can be a problem that a lot of people have heard about, but not necessarily uh, you know, heard the details of. So um, we'll get into all of these areas a little bit more later. And then finally, the, the bones themselves, um, fractures, of course. Uh, so with trauma or you know, any sort of you know, fall, even just low-grade mechanical injuries um, can result in fracturing the bones themselves. So these are the most common areas, and we'll, we'll break these down each individually. Um, you know, as far as when you should actually get in to see a doctor or shoulder specialist and try to consult to get more information, it's going to vary a little bit on your own situation. Um, if you've had an acute injury, if, you've, if you have fallen, if it's, you know, a high velocity fall, so you're skiing or mountain biking or something's happened where there's less predictable um, terms in terms of what you've done, uh, it's a good idea to get checked out, you know, sooner rather than later. On the other hand, if it's been more persistent pain over time and you've been noticing, you know, just progression in that and starting to become more symptomatic or more problematic for you, might be a good time to, to, again, get a baseline evaluation. But if it's a lower grade manageable pain that has no associated injury with it, often it is something you can safely watch um, that's not necessarily structurally damaging to do so for a short period of time. All right, so we're gonna go into uh, a few different individual problems of the shoulder. And probably the most common one that you've heard about is the rotator cuff and the problems that can occur. So uh, as we discussed before, the rotator cuff is a set of four muscles that surround the shoulder. And so uh, you can see here, the supraspinatus here is the top rotator cuff tendon that helps to elevate your arm up above your head. But there's also three other ones, the infraspinatus, which is in the back of your shoulder, the subscapularis, which is in the front, and then the teres minor, which is also in the back. And those, act, those help to rotate your arm around, kind of going off to the side and also in towards your body. Um, so uh, as you can imagine, if uh, you get an injury or you overuse your shoulder, sometimes you can uh, get problems with uh, tendons and muscles. And so there's a term called tendinopathy or tendinitis is uh, when those tendons become either degenerative or inflamed and become painful. And then in some cases, uh, uh, if you have a big injury, you can get tearing of the tendon. Um, and, and these tears can occur usually from trauma, but also with aging, the tendon quality uh, with the collagen in, in, in the tendon can become weaker. And just with simple activity, sometimes the tendon can start to tear on its own. So the symptoms usually of rotator cuff uh, tears uh, are generally uh, that people get pain in their shoulder and they start noticing that they're getting some weakness. And so uh, if you start getting pain and weakness in your shoulder, it could be a sign that you are developing some rotator cuff problems. Uh, but it's a very complex joint, as we talked about. There's a lot of different things that can go wrong in the shoulder. And so to figure out if you have a rotator cuff tear, it does require a couple things. One is that a good exam in the office uh, can figure out whether or not a rotator cuff tear is uh, present. And the other is uh, an MRI, which really looks at uh, the tendons um, well. So if you look at this, this is an MRI of the shoulder and of, of the right shoulder. So you can see the uh, ball and the socket of the shoulder right here. The patient's head would be up here and the chest is over here. Then the arm bone is down here. And what you can see is this top rotator cuff tendon that we mentioned before is the supraspinatus. And you can see this dark gray line that heads down towards the bone. So this is an intact uh, rotator cuff that looks pretty good. This is a torn rotator cuff and on MRI. And what you can see here is this white space right here uh, indicates that the tendon is no longer attached to the bone. So, uh, you know, this particular patient had a fall and uh, while skiing and uh, was unable to elevate their arm and uh, came in for evaluation. And uh, based on the fact that he had pain and weakness, we got an MRI and found this uh, rotator cuff tear. In terms of what to do for rotator cuff uh, tears, uh, you know, oftentimes people actually don't get it from an injury itself. Sometimes it can just happen uh, with, with time and just kind of wear and tear. Uh, modifying activities can actually be very helpful to let your rotator cuff rest a little bit uh, and recover. And so generally we ask people to avoid heavy lifting and a lot of overhead repetitive activities that can help to decrease some of the symptoms that you have from a rotator cuff tear. Uh, 
with any musculoskeletal condition, anti-inflammatories uh, can be helpful, so like ibuprofen or Motrin. And then physical therapy can be helpful to ensure that you don't develop frozen shoulder or stiffness of the shoulder joint, and also making sure that uh, you strengthen the muscles around any potential rotator cuff tear uh, so that uh, you can compensate for any tear that is present. So along the lines of physical therapy, um, it's pretty important that, you know, people understand the basics of, of how to approach a therapy program. Um, particularly in rotator cuff tears, it's important to balance out the mobility in the joint, not just focus on the strengthening component of things. Um, so often we're addressing uh, rotator cuff tears by trying to eventually build up some strength in your deltoid and some of the muscles around your back that can help with compensating for the area that is torn. But the, the basics prior to getting into strengthening are to ensure that you don't have any stiffness. And some of these exercises you're seeing here um, diagram that out a little bit more specifically. Um, and this is, you know, the, the gentleman in these photos is just pushing basically using his good arm uh, to try to get leverage and more motion going overhead. Um, the alternative to this is doing a table slide or leaning against a table trying to actually get more traction in the joint. Um, alternatives, if you, you have a cane or a dowel or something that you can actually use to push uh, to get more rotation off to the side, um, or stretching crossbody and behind your back, all of these movements are basically focusing on trying to stretch out every portion of the ball and socket so that you can more healthily engage the muscles to then segue into some strengthening. But it's really important to have an emphasis on motion and range of motion before you go into that direction. Once you've established a good range of motion, then you can incorporate in some light progressive strengthening. Often this is done with elastic bands so that you can control the resistance and have a more effective means to actually increase the amount of resistance or load that you can tolerate. Um, and uh, you know, big thing is as you're segueing into these strengthening exercises, not to actually let go of the range of motion exercises. Um, so it's a balance in the two. And oftentimes seeing a, a physical therapist, they can aid in, in you know, making sure there's a really reasonable home program for this. But many of these exercises you can see on the diagram are pretty simple and they're meant to be things that you can maintain for, for ongoing, you know, for life, for maintenance. So uh, one option to treat rotator cuff problems is uh, injections. And there's a lot of different types of injections. So there's steroid or cortisone injections, there's PRP uh, or platelet-rich plasma injections, and then you've probably all heard of stem cell therapy. So we'll talk about each of these individually. So uh, there, there were actually a lot of questions on this uh, uh, when people were submitting questions ahead of time. So cortisone injections can decrease some inflammation and decrease pain that are that's related to rotator cuff problems. If you have a rotator cuff tear, the cortisone actually doesn't cut, lead to any kind of healing or structural healing of the tendon, but it can decrease some pain uh, that you have there. Um, and for some people that have a lot of pain, especially at nighttime or during the daytime, it can be helpful. But there are some downsides to cortisone. It can you know, lead to infections, and it's not great for the shoulder tissue overall, and it, long term is not great. So we, we tend to try to avoid these unless... Uh, people have had pain for a very long time and are trying to avoid surgery at all costs. So when we get to PRP and stem cells, so PRP again is platelet-rich plasma. It's a component of blood where they enrich the parts that have uh, growth factors in it. And uh, uh, there's a lot in the media these days about stem cells and PRP. Uh, there's not a lot of great evidence in the shoulder joint itself. It's kind of mixed right now. Uh, so, um, the risk is relatively low. It's a little bit expensive and it doesn't, it's not covered by insurance. Uh, so you can try it, but the, uh, the evidence right now is not really supportive of its use in the shoulder. So uh, a, a major question is when is surgery appropriate for a rotator cuff tear? And so uh, probably the only indication that's very strong for surgery with a rotator cuff tear is if someone has an injury and had a perfectly functional shoulder beforehand and then now had an injury that led to weakness where they can't raise their arm at all. And so in those people, we try to get them into the operating room pretty quickly because we want to get that tendon reattached and healing as quick as possible. But oftentimes people actually develop pain over the course of a couple years and, uh, usually that's a result of the collagen or the tendon becoming weaker and then slowly pulling off the bone. And in those uh, scenarios, we try to uh, stay conservative and avoid surgery 
as long as possible. And uh, but if people have persistent pain that's failed physical therapy uh, injections and just time, then we do sometimes consider surgery. And there's different types of surgeries. There's rotator cuff repair surgery where we actually repair the tendon back down to the bone. But there's also a surgery where we just go in and clean out uh, uh, inflammation in the shoulder, the edges of the rotator cuff tear, and uh, that can actually uh, relieve pain quite a bit. The diagrams here, you can see uh, this is an arthroscopic uh, photo. So we usually do arthroscopy or minimally invasive surgery to address rotator cuff tears. And what you can see here is that this is the edge of a rotator cuff tendon, and this should be attached down to the bone right here. And so in this patient that had a, uh, a lot of weakness with this rotator cuff tear, we actually inserted anchors into the bone that have sutures that come out and we pass those through the tendon. And as we tie that down, that'll compress the tendon down to the bone so it can heal over the next few months after surgery. So um, it can be a successful surgery, but one thing that is really important to know about rotator cuff surgery is that the recovery process is, is fairly daunting. So even though the surgery we do it a lot, it's fairly easy to, for us to do, the recovery process is difficult. So a lot of patients have a lot of pain after surgery for a couple months. And uh, we usually tell patients it takes about six to nine months to fully recover from rotator cuff surgery. So in the right, uh, in the right scenario, it definitely, is the right answer for rotator cuff uh, repair surgery. But uh, as long as uh, patients understand uh, what's uh, involved in the recovery process, I think that's really important to, to understand. So um, we received a lot, again, of uh, questions, again, on uh, rotator cuff before the, uh, this webinar. So uh, Kirsten, if you want to take this first question, yeah. uh, how to heal a rotator cuff injury and avoid surgery. Yeah, and we just had a similar question that was submitted also about um, how someone is managing uh, with a torn rotator cuff and, and managing actually fairly well. Um, so the the way that people avoid surgery uh, in the in the setting of a rotator cuff tear is essentially by having some of that compensatory strength that I was talking about a little earlier. So especially um, your deltoid, which is the big strap muscles that come down your arm. Um, having those optimized and then the muscles that are around your shoulder blade or the back, um, those often do a great job of offsetting pain and pressure and load that otherwise would be going to parts of the rotator cuff that are torn. So by really trying to alter some of the mechanics and then teaching your body how to utilize these other muscular groups more efficiently, um, it's not surprising for us to see patients that often have full range of motion and you know, get to the point where they can actually function well. Um, it usually does take some physical therapy, some guidance and rehabilitation, um, and then ongoing maintenance on your own. But some patients develop that more naturally um, just through their own activities. So there are varying states of compensation and it, it can work fairly well um, treating non-operatively despite having a complete tear of the rotator cuff. So we received a lot of questions on partial thickness rotator cuff tear. So I showed you an MRI before that tendon pulling off the bone and sometimes the tendon doesn't pull off completely and only part of it pulls off. So uh, an important thing to know about this is that there's a lot of people that have no shoulder pain at all that have partial or even full thickness rotator cuff tears. And so uh, even though it's seen on imaging, it's really important to talk to a specialist about whether or not they think that the pain is actually coming from the, the tear itself. So uh, the first question here, of what's the prognosis of a partial thickness supraspinatus tear? Uh, if the pain is actually coming from the partial thickness supraspinatus tear, it's still pretty good. 70 or 80% uh, of patients get pain relief with just giving it time and with physical therapy. Uh, and another 20 to 30% have kind of more persistent issues that require injections or even potentially uh, surgery. Uh, one of the questions was, can a partial thickness tear heal? So with any rotator cuff tear, uh, the tendon actually cannot heal back down to the bone. Uh, it's very rare for that to happen. Um, the, the environment where the tendon is with the joint fluid just doesn't allow for that tendon to heal back down to the bone. And really only surgery is the only way to get uh, structural healing of the tendon. That being said, many people do fine with rotator cuff tears without surgery. And just by strengthening the muscles around uh, the shoulder around that tear, people will do fine and they, they can have really no pain in full function despite having a structural tear. Uh, and then the last question here, what is, it, what is the impact of miss, uh, missing supraspinatus tendon? Um, 
as I just mentioned previously, you don't need all of your rotator cuff to be intact to have a painless, fully functional shoulder. So typically, if you have a supraspinatus tear, we try to, unless it's traumatic, we try to treat it conservative with physical therapy. Uh, it, you can get an injection for pain and see if we can get your shoulder function better without surgery first. And then if that doesn't get better, then we usually talk about uh, surgical options. So in terms of recovery time after surgery, I went into that. Uh, the recovery time after rotator cuff repair surgery is extensive. And that's one reason we don't, we don't jump to uh, rotator cuff repair right away is because it's very difficult on, uh, especially people that are very active and working, you have to take a few weeks out of your life to get the surgery done. Sleep is pretty difficult for a couple of months. And so uh, even though the longer term outcome can be good, it's, it's pretty rough for three to six months. So, uh, you know, we usually tell people to, to uh, anticipate six months of recovery time after uh, surgery for a rotator cuff or labrum to get back to probably 80 or 90 percent. As far as the role of steroid injections and PRP injections, Dr. Shu touched on this a little bit already. Um, steroid injections can be a useful tool. Um, its main utility, I think, in, in our eyes is often as an adjunct to the physical therapy. If someone is having significant pain or difficulty trying to rehab or, you know, go through this set of exercises and, and pain is the main limitation on that, then sometimes, you know, a steroid injection done once or maybe twice is reasonable to consider. Um, it's not something we often are recommending as a long-term um, solution uh, just because it can have um, detrimental effects if you continue to receive injections in the shoulder. Um, but it is an option for pain. And as Dr. Shu mentioned about the PRP injections, again, it's, it's an option. Um, there's not a lot of data to really support its utility in shoulder specifically. Um, it is an available treatment. It's uh, not covered by insurance, so it is out of pocket. And that's something that um, someone should really consider before moving forward with it. So we're going to move on to the next subject, which is uh, shoulder arthritis. So Kirsten, if you want to take this on. Yeah. So I touched a little bit early on about the concept of arthritis and cartilage on the surface of the bones. Um, but essentially, you know, the cartilage on both the ball or the humeral head and the socket, that glenoid, um, side are what help to reduce friction in the joint. So when you're raising your arm up, when you're trying to move your arm around, um, it's painless if there's less friction involved, if there's a smooth mov movement between that ball and socket joint. As soon as you start to thin out or damage cartilage, and that can happen for a number of reasons, um, it can be hereditary, familial, um, it can be from trauma. So if there's been you know, a, a really fast uh, force trauma or a high velocity fall or something that's caused um, there to be damage specifically to that cartilage. It can result from that. Um, and it can also result from um, some systemic conditions. So inflammatory conditions that uh, wear away at cartilage. So, you know, regardless of, of the exact cause of it, as this, as the cartilage is thinning out in, re in areas, I always like to compare it almost like um, driving over a pothole. So if you imagine sort of, you know, riding on a smooth road and then all of a sudden your tire striking a pothole, you know, there's, there's a disruption in that. And often people are complaining about, you know, loss of motion, but also this grinding or, you know, kind of crunching in their shoulder. And, and that's resulting from the loss of that protective lining. Um, on, you know, really in terms of, you know, some of these symptoms that you might be feeling from the patient end, like I said, it might just be pain, some popping, cracking, um, loss of mobility. And, and then, you know, if that's significant enough and it's been progressive over time, it is worth coming in and getting an evaluation. The main diagnostic tool that we use for, for really um, identifying arthritis is x-rays. And that happens in the office um, at the same time as our exam. And we'll get plain x-rays. You'll notice on the, the x-ray on the left-hand side, that's a normal looking joint from the front. So we see the ball and socket and there's a few millimeters of space between the two surfaces. On the x-ray on the right, there's that loss of joint space. And really what is allowing on, you know, us to see that joint, the space on the left is that cartilage. So as, as soon as you break that down, you're seeing a progressive you know, narrowing of that space. And then even in this case, a bone on bone type of situation. Um, sometimes we consider MRIs on, on uh, you know, workups if we're suspicious for one, like a traumatic defect in the cartilage, but often it's diagnosed by the x-ray alone. So 
you know, in terms of actual treatment options, um, so again, activity modification, trying to actually reduce stress to the joint, um, that doesn't mean stopping all activities. So keeping range of motion up is actually healthy for the joint, um, trying to just make sure that you're actually reducing the force loads to it. So heavier weightlifting that sends a force into the shoulder, chopping wood, things that are more forceful. Um, that can potentially accelerate the arthritis. And so usually we, we talk about trying to reduce you know, those types of heavier activities if possible to reduce the pain and inflammation and acceleration of that process. Um, medications often over the counter, if you can tolerate anti-inflammatories, your Aleve, your ibuprofen, um, those can be helpful for taking the edge off. And then again, injections have a role here for reducing pain and inflammation temporarily. Um, you know, in cases where it is more advanced, that's typically when we're going on to talk to patients about surgical options. And Dr. Shu will probably talk a little more about that now. So shoulder replacement surgery is uh, typically considered in patients that have severe arthritis that's really affecting their quality of life. And so we, we often talk to patients about, you know, what will push us towards shoulder replacement surgery. And that's really when you're quality of life is impacted significantly by the arthritis. If you're having pain at nighttime and can't sleep well, if you are really limited by the range of motion and you can't do your daily activities that you want to do, um, and uh, you know if you have a lot of pain during the daytime, those are all things that can really inhibit your quality of life. And that's when we consider shoulder replacement surgery. So here's an example of someone that had very severe uh, shoulder arthritis. You can see that there's not much joint space there. The cartilage has been uh, kind of worn away and then they have a big bone spur down here. So what we can do with surgery is that we, we can insert a new ball and socket. So you can see uh, we put a, a metal ball here to replace the arthritic ball portion. And then the, we recreate this, the joint space with a piece of plastic here that is cemented into the socket bone. And all this is held together with uh, the patient's own rotator cuff muscles. And so total shoulder replacement is a very successful surgery and 90 to 95% of patients, they get very good pain relief and good range of motion. There are other types of shoulder replacement surgery that we do. So one in particular is called the reverse shoulder replacement. And typically we consider these, uh, this type of shoulder replacement for patients that have arthritis with a rotator cuff tear. So we talked previously about uh, rotator cuff tearing. And sometimes when the rotator cuff tear gets large enough, it can cause the shoulder to become a little bit unstable. And uh, due to some point loading on the ball on the socket, arthritis can develop. And so uh, you can see on, on this uh, x-ray here that the patient really has no space between the ball and the socket and uh, the rotator cuff has been torn as well. So in that scenario, we actually do what's called the reverse shoulder replacement where we reverse the ball and socket configuration. So you can see the ball is actually held in by screws and a plate into the shoulder blade. And then in the arm bone, there's a stem that goes down the arm bone and there's a, a plastic socket here. And by reversing the ball in the socket configuration, it actually allows a different muscle other than the rotator cuff called your deltoid muscle to compensate for the, uh, uh, the function so that it can help to regain function, overhead function, and also can relieve pain uh, fairly reliably. There's also, so we talked about total shoulder replacement, which is putting metal and plastic uh, uh, new ball and socket, and then the reverse shoulder replacement, which is uh, the reverse uh, ball and socket in a reverse design. There's also something called the Riemann run replacement that we consider in patients that are younger and very active. So one of the downsides to having a metal and plastic joint is that just like a, a knee replacement or a hip replacement, that piece of plastic can wear away with time. And so um, particularly in the shoulder, if someone is very active with their shoulder after a, a full shoulder replacement, that plastic can loosen. And so to avoid that, sometimes we just don't put that piece of plastic in there and we smooth out the, the socket side so that it, uh, it matches perfectly with the uh, ball portion that we put in there. And uh, this is a little bit tougher to recover from surgically, but uh, long term, especially for patients that are younger, it allows them to get into activities like heavy weightlifting or impact activities. Uh, chopping wood and a lot of things that you typically may not want to do if you had a full shoulder replacement. So a couple questions that we had on shoulder arthritis and shoulder replacement. So the first is, is 82 old for shoulder replacement? Uh, no, it is not. So uh, again, we take everything into consideration, including the age, uh, your medical problems, uh, your quality of life, and it's really discussion between 
uh, you and the surgeon to determine whether or not shoulder replacement is right. And so uh, we are always weighing the risks and benefits, but we definitely do shoulder replacement uh, surgery in patients that are in their 80s and sometimes in their 90s, just because the quality of life can be uh, diminished uh, so significantly by arthritis that shoulder replacement can be worth it. Uh, another question here is, does shoulder replacement mean you will always have to be careful not to lift heavy things? Uh, that's a great question. And so, uh, as I mentioned before, a shoulder replacement is metal on plastic, and it's just like a, a, a tire on a car. And uh, if you take good care of it, it'll last longer. If you go off-roading with it, that tire might not last very long. So uh, in a shoulder replacement, if you are doing a lot of heavy uh, repetitive lifting, that piece of plastic could potentially wear down with time and we get a little bit concerned with that. Usually these shoulder replacements last 10 or 15 years, but if uh, someone is doing a lot of heavy lifting, it, it could last only as uh, short as five or 10 years. So uh, we always talk about expectations after surgery. And if someone is looking to be very active and lift heavy things after surgery, sometimes we consider alternatives like the Rim and Run uh, replacement so that you don't have to worry about uh, that piece of plastic wearing down or loosening. And then I I think there was another question that just came in live, um, just about age restraints um, around a shoulder replacement. So just to, to kind of touch off of what Dr. Shu was just saying, um, being on the younger end, you know, uh, you know, under 45 years old even, and being diagnosed with advanced arthritis, um, it's, you know, it's reasonable in some patients to consider that ream and run uh, procedure that Dr. Shu was talking about, but it really, um, probably helps to get an evaluation in person to assess if that's the right surgery because the recovery, as Dr. Shu mentioned, can be challenging. And, and it can actually lend to, you know, more pain upright, um, ultimately with a good result. But it's it's definitely one that I think um, benefits from an in-person evaluation if whether or not that would be an appropriate decision for you. So the next uh the next topic here is frozen shoulder was actually very common. Um, Kirsten, if you want to go ahead and take yeah. this on. Yeah, so frozen shoulder, um, the formal name for that is adhesive capsulitis. And essentially, it's a condition that can arise in, in that picture. It's a good diagram of it, but it's the, the lining of the joint around the ball and socket. And this is tissue that's underneath the rotator cuff, underneath the muscles. Um, so it's on a deep level. Uh, and it goes through several phases. Um, in the first and early phases of, of developing adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder, it's inflammation of that, of that tissue. So often people have preserved range of motion early on, but pain when they're trying to elevate or move their arm quickly. Um, and that's something that can often be misdiagnosed then early on as a rotator cuff condition. Um, and then as time goes on, there's sort of progressive uh, thickening of that tissue as the inflammatory component is persistent. And as that tissue remains thick, it begins to become hard and more rigid. And that's when really it becomes more identifiable that the shoulder is stiff or that someone has adhesive capsulitis. Um, that stiffness can persist for a while before the body begins breaking it down and before you start to regain motion. But typically this is a self-limited process that sort of takes almost like a bell curve like recovery to it where it's getting progressively worse and then it plateaus and then you can start to actually recover. Um, it's, it's something that we you know, see some demographic trends as to who might get it, um, but not necessarily, none of these are necessarily causative. Um, it is more common in women than in men um, often between the ages of 40 and 60. There's um, you know, probably an increased uh, association with um, diabetics or people with thyroid conditions. But all the same, we see patients without any of those factors that come in who have adhesive capsulitis as well. Um, the diagnosis is really clinical. Um, so it's not something that we get MRIs for typically or uh, anything along those lines. It is important to get an x-ray in the office at the time of evaluation because the, the limitation in the range of motion can otherwise be present from arthritis. Um, the two both lend to limited mobility and uh, specifically in passive range of motion. So what that means is essentially when a provider tries to move your arm and it's completely relaxed, not you trying to move your arm, that there's actually still a limitation in that and there's a hard stopping point. Um, so the x-ray rules out that that's from the bones, it rules out the arthritis, and then we can accurately diagnose the adhesive capsulitis. 
state. Now it takes several months to actually start to improve upon the range of motion to actually recover, um, but the treatment is conservative, it's non-operative. The vast majority of patients will get better with time and actually stretching, um, as the slide alludes to, patients and more stretching. Um, it's a slow recovery, so it's not unusual for us to gauge um, improvement more along lines of several months, and then we often tell people it can take up to a year to really get to the other side of this where you've recovered your function. Um, along the way, we sometimes utilize injections in this scenario specifically because of the amount of pain that can be involved up front. And again, if pain is a big factor limiting how well you can stretch and try to move the shoulder and get through the physical therapy that's appropriate for this, um, an injection might be helpful for actually lending to you turning a corner. Um, when we're seeing patients that really plateau or they're actually regressing and they've been steadily stretching, they've been steadily doing the rehab that we've recommended, and they're approaching about that you know, nine plus month mark, um, that's typically when we're starting to talk about the option of surgery. And in adhesive capsulitis, the type of surgery that we're talking about is arthroscopic, so still minimally invasive, but basically just going inside and, and cutting through the scar tissue or that, that joint capsule that's really thickened up, and then trying to get that motion back at the time of surgery. The reason we don't consider that earlier on is A, because the vast majority of patients will improve without it, um, but B, also, if you try to institute that too early on, you could actually have an inflammatory reaction after surgery that lends to recurrent stiffness and actually someone feeling worse after. So then there was a couple of questions that were more specific to frozen shoulder that came in ahead of time. The likelihood of frozen shoulder occurring multiple times, um, it's, it's pretty rare. So Usually it is, it's something that happens in one shoulder and it can be ca caused by some sort of inciting event. Um, in a lot of cases, there's not necessarily an injury that someone can pinpoint, but um, other times there might be some sort of reason why they've stopped using their, their shoulder um, if they were recovering from a different surgery or if there's something else that's happened that could have triggered that inflammatory reaction to, to set off. Um, but often when you get to the other side of, of the whole process, that's, that's it. It's unusual for it to happen again on the same shoulder. It is, however, at an increased likelihood um, of developing on the other shoulder because there's probably something that, you know, is underlying in, in that individual um, that you might be predisposed to developing it on the other side. So it's more, like, it's more common for us to actually see the patients come back in for their other shoulder, not the same shoulder multiple times. Um, I guess that it should be said there's also some conditions like diabetes or you know things along those lines that could lend to someone having it multiple times but again it's not as common another common question that we got actually were, uh, is whether you get can get frozen shoulder from a, a vaccination and so with everyone getting covid vaccines we're seeing a lot of uh, shoulder pain related to the vaccines and so uh, there were a couple people that had their second COVID vaccine, uh, were diagnosed with frozen shoulder, and were asking how to manage that. So just like frozen shoulder related to other things that aren't vaccinated, uh, vaccination related, typically we do try to manage this conservatively with uh, gentle stretching, physical therapy, and giving it a little bit of time. Uh, injection can be useful to help to decrease some of the inflammation around the area. Uh, typically, we do not uh, look for a rotator cuff tear um, with MRI or anything like that because uh, the vaccination itself is typically not a cause for a rotator cuff tear. If the symptoms are persistent, people are having severe pain for a prolonged period of time, then we sometimes will get an MRI to look for other things like uh, fluid collections or to rule out infection. In rare scenarios, uh, after a vaccination, people can have pain that's uh, um, not responding to any conservative management. And sometimes we do have to consider surgery, but we're uh, generally following a very conservative route uh, with pain after a vaccination. So we're gonna move on to uh, the next topic, topic, which is shoulder dislocations and labrum tears. So uh, you've probably heard of people that have had shoulder dislocations. And the, and the reason this happens is because the shoulder, as we talked about, is a very mobile joint. It, it has the greatest range of motion of any joint in the body. And the reason that is, is because the bony constraints are, are minimized with the shoulder so that you can get good range of motion. 
because there's not as much bony constraint and it's very much uh, dependent on your rotator cuff and soft tissue to keep your shoulder stable, uh, it, it sometimes can lead to shoulder dislocation. So uh, shoulder dislocations can be caused by excessive force to the shoulder. And oftentimes the shoulder would dislocate uh, anteriorly out the front of the shoulder. And that usually happens when someone has their arm up away from the body and it gets torqued behind them. And that causes the ball to get pushed out the front of the socket and can get locked in front of the socket bone. And so uh, this is commonly seen in, in basketball when someone is going up for a rebound or to get a ball and some, another player grabs the arm and torques it back and that can cause the shoulder to dislocate. Um, so as I mentioned before, shoulders dislocate easier because there's not a lot of bone. And we often make the analogy of the shoulder being like a, a ball and socket joint, just like a, a golf ball and a golf tee. So you can see uh, in this picture right here, we have uh, the shoulder joint where this is the humeral head or the ball. And then this is the socket bone or the glenoid. And it very much is shaped like a golf ball and a golf tee. And you can imagine if you just push the ball one way or the other, it could fall off pretty easily. So uh, an important thing to understand is what prevents the shoulder from dislocating. And so there's a bumper of tissue called the labrum. So you can imagine if you had a, a golf tee and then you added kind of a rubber bumper around it, that's kind of your body has a natural bumper around to keep the ball from uh, sliding off the uh, socket. So uh, this is a diagram uh, where there's a golf ball and a golf tee, and you can see that there's very little golf tee here to hold the golf ball there. But if we make that golf tee wider or deeper, uh, which is what the labrum does, that can help to stabilize the shoulder. So if you've had a shoulder dislocation or a labrum tear, typically this is treated with conservatively with physical therapy. And by strengthening the shoulder, you can actually stabilize the shoulder. So you can imagine again with the golf ball analogy, it, if you had a golf ball on a golf tee and you pushed it down into the tee and you tried to move the ball around, you, that friction would cause the ball to not as easily fall off the tee. And that's what your rotator cuff does is it actually compresses that ball down to the tee and causes the dislocations to be less frequent. So if you work with physical therapy on strengthening the rotator cuff muscles and other muscles around the shoulder, it can help to stabilize the shoulder. And typically we ask people to modify their activities for a period of time after they dislocate. And that's to help to the shoulder to kind of scar down in certain areas that uh, cause dislocation. So as I mentioned before, a common uh, position for dislocation is when the arm is up away from the body and gets torqued backwards. So we tell people to keep their hands in front of their body where they can see their hands and that'll prevent any dislocation. Uh, in some cases, uh, dislocations happen recurrently and some people actually dislocate every week. And in those cases, sometimes we uh, consider surgery and uh, we typically can solve uh, dislocations with an arthroscopic surgery to repair that bumper of tissue called that lab the labrum. So this is a video uh, arthroscopic picture, sorry, of uh, uh, um, a labrum repair surgery. So you can see the ball is up here. Uh, off the side of the screen here. And this is the socket bone right here. And this is the labrum that surrounds the, the socket bone. And you can see here that it's torn all the way around. And this patient was dislocating pretty often. So what we do arthroscopically is that we can put anchors into the socket and then wrap that around the torn tissue and tie it down. And that compresses that labrum or that bumper back down where it needs to be. And it can restore the stability of the shoulder. So to go into just a few other areas that are um, common problems we see, fractures. Um, so the probably the most common um, two fractures that we see involve the clavicle or the collarbone, and then separately the, the proximal humerus, which is the upper portion of the bone of your arm. Um, and many times fractures can be treated non-operatively, um, and that's really a judgment um, based off of the x-ray and how far the, the bones have separated from each other um, and whether or not we'll anticipate um, healing to occur. Um, in the two pictures that are on this slide, you can see uh, the clavicle fracture on the left and then a proximal humerus fracture on your right. And in both of these situations, um, there's enough of a separation and, and change in the fracture pattern that we would recommend treating them surgically. Um, the surgeries for these. So often we're using hardware, um, plate and screws to actually stabilize. And the, the goal of the surgery is actually to restore the alignment of the bone to what it should be. 
um, we're still dependent on someone's, you know, each patient's body to actually heal the fracture. So these are typically out patient surgeries, but we often immobilize or limit uh, range of motion early on and make sure that we're getting x-rays in a repeat fashion to ensure that healing is actually taking place before we start um, allowing the patients to begin moving their shoulders. Um, there are some early exercises we usually initiate, but if someone were to be more active early on out, you know, straight out of a surgery like this, you could actually cause the hardware to fail or back out if the bone wasn't really adequately healed. Um, so it's, it's a balance, but definitely if there's been an acute trauma or injury and a, a fracture is suspected, it's important to get into the office right away and get that evaluated um, sooner rather than later so that we can get an x-ray and give you a good advisement on it. So then we also had a, a question come in about acromioclavicular separations, um, specifically a grade three uh, AC or acromioclavicular separation. And that's something that um, occurs usually also with a you know high velocity injury or fall or something where you know someone's come down onto the shoulder hard um, and it's an injury to you know the the stabilizers for the collarbone so on this is a diagnosis that's made by x-ray but on the x-ray you'll actually see the collarbone move up um, and that occurs in the higher grade injuries it's important to distinguish a low grade AC injury versus a higher grade AC injury. In the lower grades, um, below a grade three, you won't actually see much of a change in the collarbone going up down, but you'll see potentially a widening of the joint space at the acromioclavicular joint itself. And as soon as you start to see the migration of the collarbone up just a little bit as is pictured in on the slide, um, that's when we can classify the type or the severity as a grade three. There are more severe uh, separations that can occur, but at a grade three AC separation specifically, um, it's a controversial area, but actually the vast majority of patients, um, we try out non-operative treatment first, and often they can recover fine with that. Um, the, there are some other stabilizing forces around the shoulder and the shoulder can you know, keep up its endurance and you know, its physicality without being compromised with the appropriate rehabilitation afterwards. Um, but it's something we watch closely. Some other surgeons would recommend being more aggressive with it. So then there's some other submitted questions and I know we're receiving more in the Q&A too and we'll, we'll try to get to those also. Um, one was though just about uh, the cause potentially of debilitating pain in the outer upper arm. Um, that's something that can arise from a number of different causes. So a lot of the things we're talking about, rotator cuff injuries, arthritis, um, a lot of these types of conditions can actually cause pain to refer out to sort of the mid upper arm. It's not necessarily specific to the cause. So often it, it's a sort of, again, a, a judgment call on the patient's part as to how long this has been going on, what if there was an associated injury, but if, if it's debilitating and it's really harboring someone's function, it's best to get that evaluated. And again, get a baseline x-ray just to see and rule out some of those obvious, you know, different problems that we see on x-rays and then get that clinical exam to really ensure that we can diagnose and then give you recommendations. So one of the questions we had was, uh, what are the common shoulder surgeries and most successful surgeries? So uh, probably the most common problem that we see is rotator cuff uh, injuries. And so uh, the majority of those actually do not need surgery, but uh, after a period of conservative management, if they do need surgery, usually 90% of patients do have a successful outcome with that surgery uh, after that uh, six to nine months of recovery. Uh, probably one of the most successful surgeries that we have is shoulder replacement surgery for arthritis. So um, if someone is having really severe pain and dysfunction due to arthritis, if we replace that joint, uh, and go through the first, you know, couple months of the post-op recovery, patients do really well with that. And as I mentioned before, there are different types of shoulder replacement surgery, and we can uh, sort of pick the best uh, shoulder replacement option depending on what the problem is that we see on imaging and on exam. So uh, I would say the most successful surgery that we have is probably shoulder replacement uh, surgery. So advice for swimmers. Um, we got a couple of different questions about swimming specifically. Um, and one thing kind of added off of that was, you know, is it abnormal for to hear popping or cracking uh, in the shoulders? 
it's not actually abnormal. It can be completely normal to hear cracking. It's not always from the joint. Sometimes it's actually more to do with soft tissue that's around the joint. Um, I think someone had sent in the Q&A a question about bursitis. And, you know, there's different ways that your body can respond to being more active, some of which is just forming, you know, simply a little, uh, extra tissue, you know, near otherwise healthy tendons. Um, and that can cause cracking, that can cause popping. If it's not inhibiting your function and you're able to actually swim and function fine and pain is not a big factor, it's, it's safe to observe that if there's really been no, you know, remarkable injury to the shoulder. Um, but preventative exercises would include, you know, kind of, again, balancing the, the range of motion with strengthening component of things. Um, so just making sure that you have a maintenance program that's keeping up the balance of the mechanics of the shoulder. Um, and that's something that we could always, you know, kind of assess a little bit more, um, you know, by each person. If you were in the office, we could find out if there's one area that seems more limited and try to target that more specifically. Okay, so um, we have a bunch of questions that we'll try to answer live here. So uh, maybe we'll take them one by one, just so you uh, all have our information here. Um, me and Kirsten are at two locations, the Roosevelt Bone and Joint Clinic and also the Northwest Joint and Hand Clinic. That phone number there is uh, the number you can call to make an appointment. Also, if you have any questions and you want to reach out to us, you can email us anytime again at this email address here, which goes to both me and Kirsten, and we'll uh, try to answer any questions that you have. So uh, we'll start at uh, uh, some of these questions that we have here. So. Um, how do you judge if physical therapy is working for frozen shoulder? Uh, it sometimes feels worse intense deltoid pain rather than better. So that's fairly common with frozen shoulder. And so uh, we, we judge whether physical therapy is working on based on a number of different things. The most important one probably is uh, the range of motion and uh, typically the passive range of motion, meaning if you use your other arm to assist your arm in raising it above where you have the therapist move it, and you measure those numbers. And if they're getting uh, higher with time, that's a good indication. If you're getting stuck and it's not moving at all and you're still having severe pain for months, it, sometimes an injection or cortisone injection can help to turn the corner. And in some cases, especially in patients that are diabetic, uh, physical therapy and injections are not, uh, um, will not solve the problem. And sometimes we do have to talk about uh, surgery at that point. Um, Another question here is, uh, can you expand more about the current discussion in the medical literature about operating or not operating on grade three uh, AC separations? Uh, what are the competing camps and how is this topic evolving? So uh, in general, grade three AC separations, which is a low grade AC separation are typically treated non-operatively. In some cases, uh, in, in patients that are more active they consider surgery if conservative treatment has not uh, worked. But one thing that uh, you should know about uh, surgery for AC separation surgery, when there was another question about what's a uh, very successful surgery and what are surgeries that may not be as successful. Surgery for AC separation generally does not have as high of a success rate uh, as other surgeries that we do, which is why we try to treat things as conservatively as possible. The forces that are on your clavicle and your shoulder blade with an AC separation, when you try to reduce those bones together and use either suture or ligaments to do surgery to hold it together, oftentimes things stretch out. And uh, so it's not typically as successful as we would want it to be. So uh, from my view, we try to treat these as conservatively as possible for a long period of time. And it's pretty uncommon that we actually go ahead and do surgery for grade three AC separations. Uh, that being said, everyone's uh, different and it's, it's, it's good to talk to a specialist about the different options and whether the risks are, uh, the benefits are worth the risks of surgery if you're thinking about surgery. Um, Kirsten, do you wanna take this one about uh, surgery to remove a bone spur? Yeah, so it, you know, that the surgery to remove a bone spur in the shoulder, um, whether or not it's suggested, that's the question. So it, it depends a little bit in terms of where you're talking about the, the bone spur being, um, you know, in the shoulder, if there's bone spurring on the end of the collarbone um, up at the acromioclavicular joint, which is a smaller joint, not the main bone socket, um, 
is sometimes we, we do do a small surgery um, to widen that joint space and remove spurring in that location. Um, it really has, it depends on the clinical examination and, and that's something that's determined, you know, kind of in the office, if it really seems like the, the pain is coming specifically from that area. Um, bone spurring in other locations closer to the ball and socket, um, usually that's not something um, that will provide uh, really a long-term resolution to the problem because that bone spur is there more due to degenerative arthritis or arthritic changes that are starting to occur. Um, and it, it is a case by case type of situation, but it's usually not something that we suggest just to remove a bone spur that's on um, the ball, say the humeral head. Um, but again, I think if there's you know, a question you've been told you have a bone spur, it's worth coming in actually looking at that x-ray and having that conversation in person. All right, so I think we've gotten through the majority of the questions. Uh, we're reaching the end of our hour here. So uh, we just wanted to thank everyone for uh, coming to this webinar and uh, hopefully it was uh, informative for you. Uh, this is being recorded, so we will post the, uh, the uh, video on the website. And uh, again, if you have any questions or you wanna come see us in the office, feel free to email us anytime or call this phone number here and we'd ha be happy to evaluate, evaluate you in the office anytime. All right, thanks and uh, have a great day.